climate change isn't just changing the natural environment. It's changing language. Take the word megafire, which was once the way we described our largest and most destructive wildfires that burned over 100,000 acres. Nowadays, we have gigafires that burn over a million, like a 2020 fire in California that burned an area nearly three times the size of Los Angeles. Black summer was a term coined by Australians for their recent bushfire season due to the unusually intense fires that burned an area more than five times the size of Vancouver Island. And here in British Columbia, Canada, we lived through the smoke from fires in Washington and Oregon this past summer. We can recall the effects, the sting in our eyes and lungs, sunny days hidden by a smoky blanket. But there were also the effects that we didn't see. As an ecologist watching these fires burn, I saw carbon, carbon stored in trees, shrubs, and soils that took decades, sometimes centuries to accumulate, quickly combusted and sent into the atmosphere as greenhouse gases. The same gases released by the burning of fossil fuels, the main driver of climate change that we're facing today. And I saw all the climate benefits of an intact forest, carbon removal as plants take CO2, carbon dioxide, out of the atmosphere as they grow. I watched those benefits disappear as well. And these wildfire emissions are nothing to scoff at. Here in BC, our two back-to-back -back extreme wildfire seasons in 2017 and 18 each produced three times more greenhouse gases than all other sectors combined. Meaning forests, which are one of our most important assets in the fight against climate change, can just as easily be a liability. Trees can and do regrow post-fire, building up carbon as they do. But building back carbon takes time. And in the fight against climate change, time is precisely what we lack. So how did we get to an era of gigafires? And what can we do about it? Let's start by talking about fire suppression, a phrase that used to be jargon, but is now just part of our general vocabulary. Before this policy, many landscapes in North America burned regularly due to fires ignited by lightning and those ignited by indigenous people to sustain healthy ecosystems and communities. Fire maintained ecological integrity and landscape mosaics. Forested stands, clumps of shrubs, grasslands, and bare ground all intermixed. This variation changed the flow of fire across the landscape and constrained the severity of many of these burns. But European colonizers forcibly removed indigenous communities from their land and inhibited traditional fire stewardship. Around the turn of the 20th century, both Canada and the United States implemented comprehensive policies of fire suppression and effectively banned burning by indigenous communities. By intentionally excluding fire, we fundamentally altered the structure, character, and resilience of our forests. Our landscapes became dominated by conifers, which in large continuous stands can quickly carry and spread fire and increase the risk of pest and disease outbreaks, like mountain pine beetle, which has taken a staggering toll here in BC. In the absence of regular fire, and with millions of beetle kill trees, our forests are packed to the brim with fuel, ready to burn. Layered on top of these dangerous forest conditions is climate change, which brings us not only new words, but reinvigorates old words with new meaning, words like unprecedented, which I know after 2020, none of us want to hear again. But at the same time, when it comes to climate, no other word captures the moment that we're in or where we're headed. In relation to today's forests, unprecedented applies to higher temperatures, extended droughts, and rapid fire spread. So we see bigger fires more often that are harder to control and riskier to humans. In relation to today's climate, unprecedented applies to atmospheric CO2 concentrations, which ice cores tell us are higher than any time in the last 800,000 years, meaning higher than any time in the history of our species. This is a direct consequence of fossil fuel burning, which governments around the world have subsidized, even after the consequences were well understood. 
Despite language about the new normal, the changes to our climate are just getting started. If we continue to burn fossil fuels, we will keep breaking records and move deeper into an unprecedented world. So what do we do? As the conditions of our world change, we must shift our thinking, re-examine our language, and let words take on new meaning. Why? Because changes in language are a precursor to action and a first step towards change. The word conservation conjures ideas of preservation, of landscapes untouched by human activity. But in reality, indigenous people have been managing and shaping North America's landscapes since time immemorial, and now climate change is bringing human influence to even the most protected areas of the world. As temperatures shift and rain patterns change, some forests will no longer be able to support the species that we've expected there for generations. Instead of viewing conservation as the preservation of what once was, we need the language of conservation to mean preparation for what will be. In a word, we need resilience, ecological resilience, so that our forests can persist and thrive in the face of tomorrow's wildfires, so that they can continue to support not just our species, but all species that call these forests home so that forests can be part of the solution and actively remove carbon from our atmosphere. But resilience, like trust, is challenging to build, but deceptively easy to dismantle. Thousands of years of evolutionary and human history created the resilient forests of our past, and it just took over a single century of burning fossil fuels and suppressing fires to unravel the whole damn thing. Those invested in continuing to burn fossil fuels embrace the language of moderation, that climate action means each of us turning down our thermostat by a few degrees or simply abiding by Smokey the Bear's refrain that only you can prevent forest fires. But what climate action demands is the language of transformation, transforming how the energy that powers a thermostat is generated and transforming the conditions of forests themselves. Building resilience requires unprecedented action to match the scale of this crisis and an acknowledgement that climate change is not an individual problem, but a systemic one. Not an issue of choices, but of policies. That's not to say that individual decisions don't matter. They're just insufficient. Because when it comes to climate change, our systems have failed. Whew. All right, that was heavy. But there are reasons for us to hope, because if policies got us here, policies can help us get out. We could restore indigenous land stewardship, and remove the bureaucratic barriers that stifle the reintroduction of traditional fire. We can replace the language of fire suppression with that of adaptive management, which is already practiced here in BC, but could be practiced at a much greater scale. This means investing resources to create jobs so we can physically remove fuel from our landscapes by using thinning or prescribed burns. But then also, we need to use that fuel, that carbon, in ways that keeps it out of the atmosphere, even after it's left the forest. We could remove the word glyphosate, a powerful herbicide, from our forest management policies. This chemical is currently sprayed on thousands of acres of regrowing forest and promotes commercially valuable species at the expense of hardwoods like aspen, which can naturally moderate fire behavior. And finally, we have to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies, which are in direct conflict with provincial and federal efforts to combat climate change. Because when it comes to carbon, without reducing the amount of greenhouse gases that we pump into the atmosphere, all the tree planting and forest management in the world won't make a difference. The language of climate action is here for our taking. 
What we need is the collective courage to act. As individuals, we must demand transformative action from our elected officials and the systems they represent on our behalf. We can proactively manage our forests with carbon and tomorrow's wildfires in mind. We can reimagine the language of our policies to prioritize justice and climate action. And we can transform our systems to meet the urgency of this moment, the urgency of our moment. By doing so, we give future generations a fighting chance at resilience themselves, because while gigafires may be our reality today, they don't have to be our future. Thank you.